Hey everyone, my name is Tunde Olani Ron. Welcome to the Allied Media Conference 2020. It's all virtual. Um, while registration is full, you can still visit amc.alliedmedia.org and find out about all the main events and AMC at Night content that's accessible via live stream. There's, there's also a virtual guide on how to virtual AMC that shows you how to attend events and plenaries, how to connect with other participants, learn about digital safety and more. Um, so many amazing people helped make this year a virtual experience. This was an expansive, emergent manifestation. And I just wanna say, and I think we all wanna just say, Thank you to everyone's incredible work and all that you've done and you will continue to do over the next few days in the midst of incredibly challenging end times and beginning times. And really AMC is about how we are responding to the times that we are in, how Afro, indigenous and queer technologies are building futuristic frameworks for everyone's current and future liberation. Our first segment is a story written in collaboration with Sacramento Knox and Mother Monica Lewis Patrick. It's a parable about the past and future of Black and Indigenous water justice in Detroit. This parable also features a series of animation loops from a group of femme, non binary Black and Indigenous artists spanning the globe from Norway to South Dakota. It was Created in collaboration, it includes folks found from the Drawing While Black database organized by Annabelle Hayford. These animators were invited to create work based on their individual emotional responses to the story. The hours of creation to this piece really reinforced, especially for me, that storytelling is time travel. It's a superpower that everyone, all, the, all these media makers, everyone that's registered for this conference, it's a superpower that we all regularly flex and access, especially in movement work. It allows us to pull threads and to find our place in larger systems and movements in the past, present, and future. So with that, we're all in the stream right now. I wanna welcome Monitor and Onox into the stream. Peace and blessings, family. 
What up, though? All right. Okay. Uh, I'd like to say, Gina Nana Nabojo, I need to get you on a two ish court day in the name of Dishna Kais, but Kejman out in Donjaba. While we out in all in Donjaba. Uh, Anamiki Benese, Miwaji Jack Golem, Anishna Bandao, Padawada Bandao, Odawa and Dao, Ojibwe and Dao, Shawnee and Dao, Chimigwich, Chimigwich Nokomikis, Nokomis, Chimigwich Mishomis, Zagino and the Kanagan now. And peace and blessings, everyone. I bring you greetings from the great city of Detroit. Uh, my name is Monica Lewis Patrick, your water warrior where I serve as the president and CEO of We the People of Detroit. Our work is rooted in the liberation and freedom of all people, but especially black people in this city. And so much of the work that we do is around liberating water and connecting it to the human right to water. So we're very excited to be a part of this piece and looking forward to sharing it with all of you. There's a crooked river in Detroit with many names. One name we call her is Nibi. Many generations of people were born in Nibi's cradle. For years, Anishinaabe women have walked alongside Nibi to honor her and all water spirits so that there would be healthy rivers, lakes, and oceans for our ancestors and the generations to come. They walked in ceremony from the beginning of the day, moving like the river all day long until the day's end. These water walkers make offerings and sang songs to Nibi. They prayed for her to be protected and clean and to always flow down to us. In Detroit, Black people and their families grew up near Nibi. At one time, as recently as the late 1990s, the largest home ownership in the city was Black families. These families and homeowners were nourished by Nibi, as well as Oshun. Black people had their own rituals and ceremonies, sometimes connected to long-forgotten traditions and beliefs to honor the life that water brings. Colonizers try to break our links with the land and the crooked river with Nibi. While indigenous people fought to keep their bond, black women strengthened and formed new links as early as the 1800s when they used the crooked river to give newly liberated slaves safe passage from Detroit to Canada. So black people had become stewards of this land, but the increasing cost of water took home ownership out of their hands. Black women like the Honorable Joanne Watson, Mother Marion Kramer, Ancestor Charity Hicks began to raise the alarm when they saw the web of policies and protocols being spun to trap Nibi. Through privatization, high water bills, late fees and liens, homes were lost and bought by white developers and other colonizers. There was theft by displacement at a massive scale. One morning in April of 2014, Charity Hicks woke up to find her water had been disconnected without proper notice. At the time, Charity was the leading voice on water policy in the city, someone who fiercely defended her community's connection and right to water. This morning, she sprang into action, hoping to alert her neighbors, especially families with young children who might be taken by Child Protective Services. Rushing to intercept a contractor hired by the city to carry out shutoffs, she was assaulted by the contractor and she injured her foot. When she called the police for help, she was instead arrested and held in prison for nearly three days, punished for defending black children, black families, black lives. After this, many who had survived the endless attempts of the city to disconnect us from the Crooked River rose up in solidarity. Neighbors from near and far arrived with the water, and people's homes became community water stations. In Val Jean Brakeley's neighborhood, her home became a water station with donated water and food to distribute for free to her neighbors, no questions asked. People took the water they needed, along with personal hygiene kits. Children were sent to the homes of elderly people to find out if they needed water or food and to make sure they weren't alone in despair or in an emergency. Val Jean was an example of many fire starters who put out a call and created community response. 
Many people in the black community who might have been overlooked as potential allies stepped up as partners in a network to distribute water. And so many black women in Detroit like Charity Hicks, the author Tawana Petty, the great Mother Marion Kramer, the Honorable Joanne Watson, and the exceptional Cecily McClellan continue to talk about how every community in the world has a unique and critical connection to bodies of water, the element that weaves around the planet and binds us together in the sacredness, in the oneness of water. At house gatherings, we met with other black and brown mothers to talk about water, to make plans to ensure that we all could keep our connectedness to it. Indigenous families showed up to these gatherings and spoke about their lives and their battles to stay connected to the spirit of the Crooked River. At these gatherings, Nibi watched us, Oshun, Yoruba River, Orisha watched us. They watched us from drinking glasses, from crinkled bottles, from droplets of rain that fell against the window. They waited for us to see them again. Among the Anishinaabe, this moment had been prophesied as the seventh fire to reclaim our ancient future ways and teachings. At this time, we had a choice between two paths. One path was well-worn, but scorched. The other path was not well-worn, but it was green. Detroit was the canary in the coal mine. But this canary sang not only the warning songs of commodification, breaking our sacred connectedness to Nibi, it sang the song of revolutionary community, a roaring engine fueled by Black and Indigenous folks waging love and turning the wheels of a global movement. So together, we heard the canary song. The prophecy said it would be our choice upon which paths to embark. This would be the moment we had to stop the white colonial system of extraction from cannibalizing the planet. Once gathered in love and community, we realized that all of our families were struggling to stay connected to the water spirit, battling toxic pollution, high cost, shutoffs, and intentionally underfunded and crumbling infrastructure. We could feel Nibi. We could feel Oshun. We spoke and listened to each other. Glistening threads poured from our mouths and ears and spilled onto the ground. The threads began to twist and weave together as we learned of all the experiences we shared. The pattern took shape in our homes and our hearts, and we saw Nibi and Oshun. We saw and remembered the water as a spirit. This created a deep and wonderful reawakening. For some, it was the reawakening of suppressed blood memory of our own indigenous ways. We understood that we are the sacred combination of earth and water, that we can't heal from our trauma until the bonds to the water spirits are healed and protected. We created a beloved template that moves us closer to the human right to water and community stewardship of water. We prepared ourselves as elders and mothers endlessly connecting black and indigenous roots at intersections like the Great Lakes People of Color Water and Policy Camp through countless actions and meditations. As an indigenous people, we discuss a renewed understanding of clan systems that help people know our specific responsibilities in the ecosystem of our community. Now we exist and take joy in direct kinship. Black and indigenous people know we are family, and we move as one. Black life is affirmed and uplifted in Native communities. Indigenous voices are centered in environmental work. Everyone has place. Everyone has home. Now, we know the Anishinaabe language of seeds and plants. We love and defend the land and ourselves with shared knowledge on how to respond to and divert and disarm all threats. We turn one leader into a hundred, knowing that real community is held by a thousand hands, not two or four or six. We choose to live with the earth as our relative and care for it like family, so that the spirit of the earth no longer has the need to cleanse itself. We had entered the eighth fire, a loving eternal fire, one that has brought us peace and held us together as kin. Wow. 
Thank you so much, Mother Monica, Lewis, Patrick, Sacramento Knox. Um, if you'd like to learn more about or support their incredible work in Detroit, um, visit we the people of Detroit.com and the Adizuken.com. You can also follow them on social media. Um, just I'm sorry, I'm just like, it's such an amazing story. Uh, thank you to our amazing group of animators and give them a follow, show them some love. Uh, there's so many people from literally South Dakota to Norway to New York. To, it's just really incredible to get to work with all of these people. And um, I was just so amazed by how they interpreted the story that wasn't necessarily their own, but I think they found they, they read something resonated with them and they chose the sections that they wanted to animate. So that was just really powerful. Thank you. Um, our next segment is a dialogue between two incredible people. Joey Lushakur is a Southern organizer, medicine maker, and filmmaker living in Durham, North Carolina. They are the founder of House of Pentacles, a black trans film fellowship and production house. Raquel Willis is an activist, writer, and media strategist dedicated to elevating the dignity of marginalized people, particularly black transgender people. The former executive director of Out Magazine, former national organizer for Transgender Law Center, she founded Black Trans Circles, a project of the Transgender Law Center. So it is my immense pleasure to invite Raquel and Joey Liu to the stream. Hi. Hey. <laughs> yeah, um, you too, even under these weird circumstances. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, Wow, Black trans media, Black trans media for liberation. Um, I'm curious. When you feel like has been, yeah, is there a moment that you feel like you've you've seen black trans media? You're like, uh, that's it in your growing up and coming and coming along. In my growing up, wow, um, yeah. I mean, I, I think first I just I ha I feel like I have to acknowledge our folks. So you know, this is so digital, and I know like the nature yeah. of digital is so. Um, <laughs> solitary it in some yeah. ways pulls me apart but i feel the energy i think joey also feels the energy um and yeah was there a moment i really saw myself growing up i think i always saw like fragments you know and i think that's true for a lot of um folks of uh of experiences that often aren't in the mainstream or aren't um on the marquee and you know i i remember growing up seeing bits and pieces of myself in like the gender nonconformity of musicians like Missy Elliott, you know, and, and that whole kind of Afro-futuristic vibe. I mean, that's so, I know now that's so like black and trans, you know, like that's so a part of how we even move through the world. So much of our lives is uh, speculative fiction. Um, and yeah, and I mean, I, I definitely think, you know, the bits and pieces you would get of like drag performance and stuff on TV in the nineties, uh, was like, you know, li little pieces of it. But did I ever feel like I saw a fully realized like example of representation? I don't, I don't think so. Um, I didn't know anything about like, Lady Chablis and Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. You know, I was young um, yeah. and she was from Savannah. I'm from Augusta, Georgia. So like that would have been a perfect sync up if if, yeah. if I was like really of an age to understand what was going on there. But what yeah. about you, Joey? What did you see that kind of resonated with you? You know, I, I didn't feel like I saw myself in media much when I was growing up, which is how I became a media maker. When I look back, I do see bits and pieces, like you like you mentioned. Um, yeah, as a Jamaican youth, I think maybe Grace Jones might have been kind of like a gender bending reach, um, or somebody that just felt really pu pulled out of uh, typical society uh, like gender roles. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until maybe like around twenty. 
2013, 2016, um, that I felt like, oh, I can start to kind of reach for myself in different pieces of media. Um, probably the first moment I remember feeling that way was while uh, watching Pelo Malo, which is like this Venezuelan uh, film called Bad Hair, or translates to Bad Hair, which is really looking at um, pigmentocracy and uh, colorism and racism. Um, but, you know, on kind of like that binary of, of black and white, good or bad, there's also like this nine-year-old kid that's like struggling through like wanting to have this long hair, wanting to, um, yeah, not even without, I guess that was probably one of the moments where I first saw gender being completely detached from sexuality and like, oh, okay, this kid is going through something that I can, you know, resonate to what this person is going through. Um, but yeah, it is not until super, super, super recent uh, that I feel like I can actually place Black trans media, Black trans folks in film, uh, in all sorts of uh, mediums and see folks, yeah, on screen. Yeah. No, that I, <laughs> I need to watch that. I'm I'm so curious about um, the conversations they were having then about um, colorism and all of these different things. Um, yeah. yeah, I guess um, you know one of the things that is interesting to me is like I feel like we are as Black trans folks constantly kind of as we live our lives and build futures, also unearthing and uncovering history. Yeah. And so in a lot of ways, all of these new stories that we're making are coupled with stories that we're pulling from the yeah. past. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so I, I, you know, for me, one of the things that has uh, spoken to me a lot, um, and I have to give it up to Tourmaline for her powerful <laughs> work. Um, yeah. I mean, and, and she started to say this more, but, you know, she's really someone who was ahead of the curve in terms of this moment mm -hmm. of talking about Black trans folks throughout time. Yeah. And I think about her recent um, film, Salacia, that, that's mm -hmm. um, at, at MoMA, um, and how, you know, she really kind of expanded the story about Mary Jones, a black trans mm -hmm. woman in the 1830s um, from Seneca Village, which was like a free black village in uh, literally in Central Park. Like that's where it was. Um, and so I just, I think about the power of knowing that and what that mm -hmm. meant to me, even, even in my twenties, right? Mm -hmm. Just getting that, but how, how much higher I can hold my head up knowing yeah. that everything that folks have been saying about us being brand new, we've been here and we got yep. the record, we got the receipts. Yep. Yeah. So what about, are there any figures, stories from history that you've uncovered that just speak to you? Oh, the story of Polly Murray does actually. Mm. Um, and and the, yeah, it's it's honestly kind of like this full circle 360 experience every time I, I look back at Polly Murray's work and the extents that Polly Murray went to um, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s to document his transness and and also kind of like the way that transness gets tied up uh, in medicine as well. And um, I think that when I, oh, when I look, oh my gosh, when I think about this work that Black trans folks are now doing with like media, uh, whether that be written, film, whatever, and the work you're talking about of how it loops time um, or how time just continues to be kind of like this revolving door. Um, I think about, oh, wow, all the like richness and the kind of like speculative fiction or uh, sci-fi elements that we kind of reach for and bring into now. Um, and how, yeah, how, <laughs> how there are so many stories that haven't been told, right? So it's not difficult for us to kind of be able to add an, a story from the past 
to whatever folks are going through right now. It's like, okay, these stories haven't been told and it's the same struggle also. You know, there hasn't been much movement on what folks are, are kind of needing to speak out against. Um, ooh, yeah, so <laughs> that makes me think of like the ways that media becomes a technology for our healing and, and the ways that uh, every time that I see a black trans person on camera looking dope, looking they fly brilliant self, how I feel like there's a part of me that is healed. There's a part of Polly Murray in me that is healed from way back in the past. And that cyclical ever revolving door of both healing and kind of, yeah, media being this technology that we can use uh, to, to pass something back to our folks and to like redignify our folks in the ways that they, they weren't allowed uh, when they were alive. Um, yeah, just really, really moving and powerful for me. What about you? Where are you seeing, uh, yeah, Black trans, cultural production, media, all of that right now and where it's heading? Yeah, um, you know, I my, I guess, trajectory has kind of been um, a mixed bag. You know, I, mm -hmm. I studied journalism, um, worked in, in at a small newspaper, you know, in the closet about my identity because I was in a, a very um, conservative area in Georgia at that time. And really seeing kind of the emergence, of course, of, of trans folks uh, in a more visible way, obviously has been powerful been empowering, although we know there are so many kind of, um, there are so many complicated feelings about visibility, which are so warranted. We have to continue yeah. to have a real conversation and just deconstruct that. But then, you know, I've worked in um, magazines and kind of the corporate media space and also in nonprofit communications. And I think everywhere is having a reckoning right now, honey. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, you know, it's long overdue. I think we're grappling not, I, I think people are having a surface basic level conversation about representation. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that that's actually what most folks of more uh, of identities and experiences on the margins are really hungry for. We're hungry for something deeper. Yeah. You know, we're hungry for folks, whether they have our experiences or not, to have on their creative hat of coming up with solutions that will actually empower us in the long haul. Because um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think organizing in whatever lane you're in, for me, it's cultural organizing, is a creative endeavor. You know, it is that speculative fiction. It's that imagining. It's, you know, all the things that people are imagining in this conversation around abolition is, mm -hmm in many ways speculative fiction it's it's cre yeah. a creative never and so i think about the need to abolish many of these other systems what does abolition look like in a media context or in a um print context you know um and i think a lot of that comes from us reimagining leadership stripping mm. away these ideas of leadership, of hierarchy that are so steeped in white supremacy and capitalism that actually restrict and stunt us and think about what leadership could look like if we actually figure out ways to uh, democratize it. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, we need more. If someone brought this up on an, in another conversation I was in about um, what does it look like to to really live in like co-op models around media production. You know, mm -hmm. I think about the work that you mm -hmm. do with House of Pentacles, yeah. you know, the, the need for these uh, collectives and how it brings more power back to us, to the source of mm -hmm. these stories. And then I also just think about the, I think about the power, like when I think about House of Pentacles, right? And that's like our history of organizing within a house family mm -hmm. structure, yeah. you know, people like Crystal Abeja and, and ball culture, but like houses as an organizing unit in other spaces. Like I, my mind is all over the place right now, but like 
I think what you're doing is the future, really. It's, it's us getting all of the, the mm. means of production in our hands. Mm. Yes. Wow. That is, that's that's exactly the goal. Um, and that's, yeah, that's my manifestation for the next five years. Like in five years, <laughs> okay. Black trans media production will be uh, 100% Black and trans you know, and I think that we've made strides, you know, like now we have uh, Jenna, Ma we have folks in like producer role, directing, we have folks who are not just in front of the camera, not just there for uh, visibility or prop, but is actually there, like taking up full human space and <laughs> um, and expanding even beyond that too. Um, yeah, and I see like, okay, in five years, I see us not needing to rely on any additional industries to get our stories mm -hmm. out. Um, yeah, I see us really being able to, to tell fully autonomous stories, not needing to filter our words, not needing to filter the bodies that we put on screen. Um, yeah, that, and it can only go up from there, honestly, but I, I, I yes, I resonate with what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I y'all are doing such dope stuff and I, I'm excited about, you know, just what can be built in that kind of nurturing environment, right? Like who knows how to nurture us mm. like us? Nobody, right? And and what kind of creativity can come from that? Um so in thinking about that and kind of imagining this world, um do you have a moment where you felt in control of of your own media of your cultural production i mean i'm, I'm sure you have because of the nature of your work now and what you know yeah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yes i think about yeah i think about my uh coming out experience to my family when i was sharing with them that i was trans um, and that process went through the making of a film, the first ever film that I worked on, which was Mama, Can We Talk? Um, and just even the process of making this film, <laughs> it's like the, in my body, this is what I locate as like a black trans production. Um, but yeah, I remember just kind of like reaching out to or just Facebook calling, are there black trans people who want to help tell the story, who want to kind of be a part of this thing? Um, and we would kind of just like caravan to wherever city. One time we went to uh, Atlanta um, to do, to do an interview set with Michaela. Um, and for this one, we went to the Bronx. So we drove and we picked folks up on the way to the Bronx uh, to for me to come out with my family. And I think about <laughs> uh, the moment of having a room full. It's a small Bronx apartment. Um, but this moment of kind of me and the rest of my family on the couch and behind these cameras uh, are all those picked up these equipment and are figuring out how to use it. Um, and I think about all of the all of the things that I got to receive in that very organic moment of, hey, uh, here is um, black people that I love. Th these are my folks, uh, and 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 here also are folks and people that are me. Here are black trans people that I love as well, and we're here to really have a conversation where we're fighting for each other, in a sense. And I don't think that that conversation, that film would have uh, landed. I don't think my experience with my family would have been what it is right now were it not for that full black trans cast that was in the room, were it not for like having full autonomy uh, in the editing room um, and being able, I think about even new pieces that I do now and I don't know, it's just a sense of righteousness that comes from being able to to control all, to control for all of the uh, racist and transphobic systems that are already in place, and to do things to filter those back out, so that who you see on screen is minus all the transphobia that would have been present in the camera person's angles that they put up. Uh, you know, it's minus all of the anti-blackness that is present in the Nikon's uh, algorithms for black people's skin tones, you know, all of these things you get to, to, filter, to filter out 
um, and to craft. And, and I think, yeah, I think this is why I love this space. This is why I love um, film right now because I don't have the same experience <laughs> when I'm necessarily working for pay or working under somebody else's, uh, yeah, direction of like, this is the story that needs to be told. Um, so yeah, th I think the making of that film was probably one of the moments where I felt like I had uh, the most control or autonomy over what happened. Same thing with no masculinities as well. Um, yeah, what about you? Do you feel that, do you get to feel that when you start writing? Do I feel that when I start writing? Um, in a way, yes. And I think that's what's frightening, right? I, I think, you know, we have this idea that when we feel in control, it necessarily feels, it, it makes you feel like powerful or empowered. And a lot of times that's not the case, y'all. Like, when I'm writing, you know, it, it's like a form of masochism sometimes, you know, because it's like you're just thinking to yourself about all of the brilliant things that people have created and that have they have written. And I think that that's just normal, right? I think that that's just mm -hmm. human. Um, and particularly for Black folks, trans folks, queer folks, it's like, that imposter syndrome can be so loud, you know, yeah. in your head. Um, and so it's not always empowering. Um, more often than not, it it isn't. Um, but when you do get that moment and you're like in flow and you're just like, oh, okay, I'm a bad guy out here. Like, I got a little cute mind or whatever. Mm. Um, I mean, those moments are gold, and it's like you're you're chasing that a little bit to have that moment again. Um, so that's a piece of it. But I think another piece of it is also I feel like a lot of my work is in service to the community, right, or in service to our movement, and just being able to get something done sometimes can be enough right like you know i think about when i was uh, working on the trans obituaries project at out um it it was a you know a three-part um editorial feature on the epidemic of violence and it was a grueling process, not just because of the writing and kind of the technical part of it and the investigation of parts of it, but interviewing different families, you know, who had lost um, the trans women of color in their lives um, was difficult. It was grueling. Um, and so there were really moments in that where I felt happy clearly because a, a lot of it is really heavy and a lot of it is like documenting right i mean i i liken it a lot to um the work that like an ida b wells did you know around the lynching and and what was happening to black folks particularly in the south um and it's it, it's important but it is hard work to document the hard things that are happening right now but I will say, I think being able to build out space in that project to elevate the voices and expertise of community organizers and activists who've been working on these solutions, like that was the fulfilling part. And, and being able to um, be in space with them uh, when we launched that issue was also powerful. So I think you just got to find your moments of hope when you can, you know, mm -hmm. and if you bake them into whatever your project is great like do that <laughs> but also you know sometimes just the completion can be enough <laughs> that's the word honestly um yes and i'm manifesting that also in the next five years yeah we won't we won't just be stuck with uh this particular type of storytelling and that we will be able to branch out and tell the stories that are on our hearts um, in the deeper places of our bodies. Stories about black trans mermaids, I'm looking at you, Michaela. <laughs> um, and just like all the, all the things that give us life, 
um, uh, yeah, that aren't necessarily coming from a place of fighting for life. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's such it's such a balance of um, holding the those things that are hard and holding those things that are you know bring you hope. Um, yeah. And I, I, I just love that our fields are just like expanding so much more so that there is space to do that visioning, you know, do that work that's rooted in, in the fiction that is affirming. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about the images, obviously, of like Texas Isaiah, okay. you know, and, and, and how beautiful that is, right? And and we have obviously have so many more people who are um, doing their thing in Hollywood. Um, but, you know, I think the lifeblood of, of our black trans renaissance is the independent creators, you know, the folks yeah. who do things, make things, you know, when they're not supposed to have anything, mm -hmm. right? And they nevertheless, they, they continue to create. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, shout out to all the YouTubers, all the <laughs> random video makers, uh, random writers. Um, and I'd love to share an invitation, um, for folks. All right, so. I'd love to share with you all an invitation uh, for how you can personally, we talked a little bit of just about uh, the ways that our work um, is tied particularly to the violence that our community faces. Um, but I'd love to share a way that you can personally interrupt violence against black trans women and increase safety for all black trans people. Um, campaign Thrive, and if we, uh, have that shared. Campaign Thrive is an iterative movement campaign to build power and increase safety within and across the Black trans community in 2020 and beyond. It's anchored uh, by House of Pentacles, which is a Durham, North Carolina-based um, Black trans film training program and production house. The campaign, though, is, um, we could go back the campaign is uh, based in the work of the Black trans philosopher, researcher, and theorist, Naomi Simmons Thorne, who shares that within the 86 years that constituted the American lynching era, 3,340 Black people were accounted for being lynched. So this means that on average, about 40 Black people were being murdered annually. Um, for the past five years that we've been tracking the murders of Black trans people in the United States, that number has looked like about 26 to 30 black trans folks. And this is majority black trans women and femmes have been accounted for. And we also know that this number is the reality is uh, black trans murders often go on, uh, unreported and don't get classified as the hate crime that they are. Um, yeah, so we're being murdered at a rate of 65 to 75% of that at the lynching era uh, and yeah, we're almost a statistically negligible subgroup of both the black population and the US population, uh, which is to say a genocide is upon us and everything in our collective powers must be done to interrupt this violence. Uh, we have a plan to intervene and it calls for transformation, y'all. It calls for uh, transformation of cis folks, the shedding of uh, cis folks transphobia and the dismantling of transphobic infrastructure in our communities. Uh, it's not enough that cis folks agree with us and we share our work, we share our brilliance. We need cisgender comrades whose alliance shows up as a daily practice to undoing the subtle nuances of their own transphobia. Uh, we need people who are willing to commit their lives uh, and their life's work to dismantling transphobia in their families and in their communities. We need people willing to get on the phone with their grandma to talk about the transphobic thing that she said at dinner last, time, last night or uh, folks willing to fight their own brothers and their aunties and uncles, because if you don't, then we gonna have to fight them. Um, and if you don't, it will mean the life and breath of another black trans femme. And yeah, so transphobia isn't a problem that black trans people created, so it's not our jobs to fix. 
yeah, we do the labor of this. What can you do though? Um, I think everyone hearing this right now, uh, one of the first things you can do is make a commitment to never let yourself witness violence against a black trans person without intervening. So in this moment committing, I will never let myself witness violence against a black trans person without intervening, putting myself in there. Um, and second, you can fund the vision of black trans leaders, especially organizations run by black trans femmes. There are plenty out there uh, and also feel empowered and on task to go and undo that transphobia that you know exists within yourself. Uh, the transphobia you know exists in your parenting style, uh, in your hiring, in your families, your job, uh, whether you're a physician, lawyer, whatever it is that you do, you know where that transphobia exists. Uh, so yeah, you feel on task to go and undo that so that another black trans person won't have to lose their life because of your complacency. Um, yeah, if you'd like to, to follow uh, and help fund this work as it continues to grow, uh, you can go to the HOP website, houseofpentacles.org, um, and sign up at the bottom of any of our pages. Uh, you could also follow House of Pentacles on Instagram and Facebook. That's at House of Pentacles. Um, for BTGNC, Black trans and gender nonconforming folks doing similar work in, in your local communities, please uh, connect with us. We want to amplify your work. We want to share resources uh, nationally. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, if you'd love to give to our work, you can find at bit.ly, give to hop. That's bit.ly, uh, lowercase, give to hop. Thank y'all. Thank you. I'm gonna give snaps because we're not of the audience, but I, I just, I feel really, really inspired by that talk. And uh, please make sure if you're following along in the Facebook or the YouTube, of AMC, there's a link in the chat uh, for to support Campaign Thrive uh, by House of Pentacles. So make sure you follow that link and learn more about how to support the campaign that Joey Lee was just speaking about. Um, thank you so much to Raquel and Joey Lou for that conversation. I was just like <sighs> the whole time listening and watching. Um, what just hearing that conversation is such a reminder of every everyone, all of our potential to shape the systems around us, whether it's subtle in subtle or really dramatic ways. Um, and, and so right now, AMC would like to take a moment to honor the profound contributions and impact of one such person, Stacy Park Milburn, who we recently gained as an ancestor this spring. Stacy profoundly shaped the AMC between 2007 and 2012, at a time when the conference was reinventing itself. Stacy created a powerful, protected space within the AMC where a disability justice politic and community could grow. She and her other just she, she and other disability justice leaders taught and are still teaching the conference as a whole about accessibility. So to honor her, Allied Media Projects is committing to ever increasing levels of accessibility within AMC and AMP as a whole. We're welcoming ideas for how this looks beyond expanding ASL, CART and language justice services and keeping the AMC affordable. Please visit the website post-conference for a survey where um, AMC is gathering feedback on how this whole virtual experience really went, how this conference really went for you and how we could increase accessibility for people. We also recognize that during AMC, people are here and they're also potentially in times of grieving. So we wanted to share some virtual spaces to grieve collectively. The healing justice spaces uh, during AMC are all uh, listed and sketched for people who are registered. And we, we encourage you to attend. Just please note which spaces are for specific groups. Our last segment 
a really joyful collaborative endeavor with a Grammy award-winning composer, songwriter, and bassist Esperanza Spalding, along with transdisciplinary artist, designer, trickster, I love that, and wake worker, Bronte Velez. Uh, it began with one of many questions, the principal one being, what is a frequency that heals? So Bronte and Esperanza joined uh, in what I hope will be an ongoing collaborative with an incredible artist, multidisciplinary artist, performer, filmmaker, and harpist, Aya Simone, singer, songwriter, and event organizer, Bev Love, musician, I'm sorry, icon, icon Bev Love, musician, a dancer, and teaching artist, Super Cool Wicked, along with vocalist, producer, and multimedia artist, Keswa, so, so thrilled to welcome them all into the stream. Hi. Hey. What a blessing. What a blessing to be here with you. Such a blessing. Love you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Bronte. They, them. I'm calling him from Tongva territory. Do you want to say where you're calling him from, Esperanza? Yes, I'm Esperanza. I'm calling in from Thai Valley, Oregon, which is the um, homeland of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Katlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other tribes who live along the Columbia River in this part of Oregon. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful for um, the many rivers that brought all of us here today and the gift um, of the shares before us and so humbled to be in conversation with you and Aya, Simone and Bevlove and Keswa and Super. And I arrived here today through Led to Life, um, a black and queer collective that explores the prophetic practice of alchemy as a medium to reimagine justice. So we're asking how can Black ecofeminist public ritual, grieving, clearing, melting weapons together, and transforming them into ritual objects and tools to heal and repair ceremony and land, shift our relationship to matter, memory, place, time, and trauma. And I'm moved by two quotes that I want to invoke here to open us into the music today that both ground our practice with Led to Life and reflect the AMC's theme and question this year that you all also explored, uh, what is the frequency of healing? And the first is from Mark Anthony Johnson's article, Wellness and the Black Molecular Future, where he writes, quote, Black wellness is the antithesis to stay violence, amen, unquote. And another where Jim Perkison, Detroit theologian and poet said, quote, I'm being rearranged on a molecular level by black rage and black humor, unquote. <laughs> so Esperanza, I'm thinking about how we're exploring these questions and themes together and also in our personal practices. And I'm curious to hear from you, what rearrangements are possible if we initiate healing from the molecular, ancestral, and fugitive wisdom of vibration, a frequency mm -hmm. of music, and who would you cite as a lineage that made room, change space and time through frequency music for us to continue and, and trust these questions now? Mm -hmm. Mm, I'm so grateful for the phrase making room. When I think about sound intervening and healing at the molecular level, I think of how much vibration we've been exposed to and how many generations of vibration have been informing the blueprints that we carry and then manifest from our expectations of ourselves and of reality. And I remember reading about how all matter starts with vibration. I mean, we know this. It's like a fundamental precept of physics. Anything that can be perceived or engaged with is at its essence vibration. And I think that sound, words as sound, words as spell, 
tones, our melodies, our stories, our jam sessions, our wails, our whispers. Um, we can tune them with the intention of healing and recalibrating the vibrational imprints that we carry without even knowing it. And as we know, one of the gifts of music is that it, it makes us stop. It can, it can stop a thought process. It can, it can underscore something that we're seeing and completely change the meaning. So I would say, I would invite us to remember that we are fundamentally vibration. And first of all, we may have forgotten how much of our vibration has been informed by music we didn't ask to be exposed to, by vibrations we didn't ask to inform our blueprint. And starting right now, we can change the intention of every tone that we emit and every tone we expose ourselves to. And not only that, I believe that activating healing sounds from within acts as like a, a counter energy. You know, like if the, if the water is flowing out of the spigot, no water can come up in the spigot. So when vibrations that we don't want in our molecular space come at us, like we can set the tone from within. We can sing. We can sing to that. We can speak to that. Um, that is what comes up. Oh, that, uh, only that? <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless, bless that prayer and that vision and that sovereignty um, of vibration. And I'm excited to, to weave in these other prolific Detroit-rooted <laughs> artists that um, you had the pleasure of collaborating with um, for this opening piece, Aya Simone, Bev Love, Keswa, super cool, wicked, welcome. Um, bless your work and your practices and the spiders that must have conjured us here to weave you all together. Um, I'd love to hear a little from you all on what it means to create a vibration of enchantment for Black femme and trans livability and community from a place, from Detroit? What did it mean to create this music from your geography? And what was it like for you all to attune to and create a healing vibration together uh, while also distant from one another? Mm, I can start. Uh, well. Just thinking about music in a, in the thought of healing um, just changed the entire way that I approached the music. At first, it was a little bit intimidating because I know that when I make music, it heals me. Um, and then I hope that in turn, it would heal other people. But to have that intention going into it um, just made it seem a lot more godly, a lot more holy. Mm -hmm. So um, the words didn't really come from a logical space they just kind of sipped out from Aya's beautiful heart so um yeah I just feel like making music like that more in the future um like you can only imagine what kind of outcomes that I could have now that I had have had this experience thank you yeah and I guess what I'm sorry, what comes to mind for me is like, it's this all encompassing kind of bridge that's being built from me to the next person, from all of us collectively to God, from God, all around. It's kind of like light, you know, light emits in every direction. And I think that to be in this space with these people, these wonderful people that, I, that, we, got, that we all got to collaborate with, was exactly what I just said. We just emitted light. It's like we, we, I don't know if you all watch Avatar, The Last Airbender, but we lightning bended. We took in the energy with a pure heart and emitted this frequency that um, definitely helped me. And it gave me kind of new eyes, you know? Um, yeah, and it's just something that I'm very grateful for. It's, it's really a nourishing process, so. Yeah, I'm really happy that that happened. And it was just so interesting how um, we were not confined and not bound by space. 
and time. I think that when you're dealing with such a spiritual thing, when you're singing, you're really, you're elongating the vowel sounds, which is the spirit in the word. And the consonant is the matter. And we're really just opening ourselves up to spirit together. So the spatial differences and the time differences didn't matter because we were on that wave, which was super amazing. Praise. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go. Um, I think about like creating like livability, whether it's like a vibration or a piece of music or laughter or an expression of kindness. I think the overarching theme of what creates black trans and like femme visibility is kind of like, is creating ecosystems of care. Like creation is our lifeblood, is what makes us like human. It's what, you know, what we need to survive and to give ourselves meaning. And so, um, and the creation work that we did is like, it was so beautiful. I actually like the, the fact that it was digital. Um, I tend to, I tend to clam up when I'm in a group sometimes and particularly in a musical setting. And so being able to be in the studio and give this and offer this, this heart melody um, to the other people was like, y'all got the most vulnerable part of me because I was by myself when y'all did it, when I did this. So I hope y'all like it. And I hope that you see me and understand where I'm coming from. And so that, the distance actually became more of an um, of an asset for me um, to to give my full self without feeling the my urge to kind of like cover mm -hmm. and and so but also the other thing was like the one thing that I really liked about the process was just how deep and contemplative like the thoughtfulness of every step and the thoughtfulness of the of it getting to those answering those questions with them that was that that was that was the work for me so could you repeat the, could you repeat the question one more time? yes of course um the question was what does it mean to create a vibration of enchantment for Black femme and trans livability in community and from a place from Detroit? And what was it like for you all to attune to and create a healing vibration together while you're also distant from one another? You can answer any or all of that question. For me, it was a very, it was just such a, a beautiful experience and piggybacking on what I was saying, felt extremely vulnerable because um, I typically create with non-femme people, or I have in the past. And it's very, um, sometimes it can be emotionally challenging, but in this particular space, before we even heard anything we already we had set an intention and it was so beautiful and it just felt so resonant with my aspirations for my my own personal practices of around creating um and and well-being and when i got to actually record and i got to share space with bev it was so magical it just felt like a natural outpouring of like affirmation and poetry and harmony. And it was very experimental and free form and just life of for me. Um, Thank you. I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, Yvette Jackson is not in this room right now, not in this um, moment, but surely here in spirit and stepped in and supported us in such a beautiful way by producing and weaving together and mixing and creating interstitial magic around all of these gems um, that we each brought to this collective brew. So thank you, Yvette Jackson. 
thank you each of you for your beautiful offerings and to hear your how your wisdom weaves into the music um, that we're about to be blessed with. So I am going to joyfully pass it to Esperanza to guide us into a meditation to experience um, this offering. Thank y'all. Just briefly, I wanted to say we had originally thought it would be beautiful to have accompanying images and videos to support this speculative future that we've all built with our prayers and our intentions and the healing divine sounds of our voices. And on one of our later calls, we came to the remembering that all of our imaginations can do way more than what we could put together in 11 minutes of some imagery. So this is an invitation for your mind to join us in the co-devising and for each one of us to feel free to go to the place that this music is the underscore of. Go to the place that we need to be, where we are safe and healed and held. And this is the music that's accompanying you. And I'll start by inviting us to imagine that place where all masks have been removed. All masks have been removed. All masks have been removed. And our hearts speak freely.
send it, washes it away The lack, the sadness, the hurt and the shame Hey Time is a bomb, it heals all in the end Break it all down to rebuild and to mend No better time than the now to begin Just like the sun, we always rise again Y'all up, because that really gave me everything in life. Thank you so much to Esperanza Spalding, Bronte Velez, Aya Simone, Bev Love, Super Cool Wicked, Keswa for that offering. Um, thank you to, again, the producer Yvette Jackson. Thank you to Assemble Sound for donating studio time and engineering staff, as well as AMC program coordinator Liz Kennedy, who helped facilitate the whole project. 
Um, this is the time, listen, this is the time for individuals, organizations, institutions to really intentionally and generously pour back your love, your attention, your energy in resources into the lives and the work of Black femmes who abundantly create and generate all this art and culture in Detroit, like period, like it's time. Um, yeah, so with that, I hope dipping into the stream fed you some kernel of inspiration, joy, reawakening, connection, meditation, relief, connection. Um, and that kind of brings us close. So I wanna say thank you to all of our incredible sponsors and funders who made this year's AMC possible. Thanks to Mainstream Media and People's Hub who work with AMC on this year's virtual just experiment. Without your work, this could not have been possible. And thank you to all of the AMC volunteers and staff uh, you're honestly just magical and you hold so much, you are enrich the soil so much for this work to happen. And if you're interested in working with a a Allied Media X or AMC, uh, they're actually currently hiring two major positions, a co-executive director and a communications director. So check out those listings. Uh, feel welcome to contact AMP. Stay tuned for the party at nine. It's getting started really soon with live performances from Motor Cam, Mona Lisa. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be lit. Uh, and Dance with DJs, J House, Problematic Black Hottie and Stardust. Thank you so much. Wishing you comfort and health, peace, love, everything. Have a good night.
So yeah, you know, I just met these these, these, these wonderful people, and, it, and it's, it's really uh, awesome to get to play with y'all. Um, and we're just kind of flowing for y'all. Is that cool? 